Good evening to everybody. I'm Giovanni Corona, the uh, president of the ESSM. It is a pleasure to host you in this new series of webinar supported by IPSA. Uh, this is today we have a very, very hot topic. So first of all, I'd like to give uh, to, to thank IPSA for supporting uh, uh, this new series of webinars in 2023. Uh, now it's time, uh, I'd like to re remind you that the webinar is going to be recorded and it will be uh, available to our website in about one month time. So especially for the ESSM members, there's no problem. You can find it uh, on our website. Uh, so I'd like to give the words to Carlo, our past president, uh, to uh, say some words on behalf of the SSM. Please, Carlo. Thank you very much, uh, I'm very happy. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. So I'm very happy to spend the two points. The first is that I'm very happy that we are continuing this collaboration with IPSCA, uh, that it's very very nice, very, uh, let's say, efficacious uh, in terms of collaboration. And secondly, I want to thank you for being able to build up uh, this strong relationship, and I hope we will continue this way in the future. So thank you very much, and enjoy this nice webinar. Thank you, Carlo. Uh, thanks again for uh, your support and for being here. Uh, now it's time uh, to thank the chair of uh, ESSM Scientific Committee, Michael Fodd. Uh, he did a great job for our past Congress in Rotterdam and assure uh, the new Congress that will be in Bari will be even, will be even better. So please, Michael, you can uh, say some words uh, on behalf of the ESSM. Thank you so much, Giovanni. Yeah, on behalf of the ESSM, on behalf of myself and the whole scientific committee, I want to welcome everybody to this uh, webinar. I think these are some very great educational opportunities that we have online with support of IPSA. So we're very thankful to them. And as Giovanni is, is telling you, we've already started preparations for Bari. So I think if you like tonight, you will love the conference and you should certainly come join us there. Thank you. Thank you, Mikkel. Now it's turn to the Deus Ex Machina, so the chair of the educational uh, committee who along his committee prepared this fantastic uh, new series of webinars. So I'd like to give uh, the podium at least uh, in a web way to Dania Rosmanov, the chair of the educational committee uh, of ESSM to introduce you uh, the webinar of tonight. Please, Dania. Thank you, Giovanni. <clears throat> On behalf of ESSM, um, on behalf of uh, the Kiel University, um, I would like to in, in welcoming you to, to this incredible meeting. And this is very special webinar because we have two outstanding speakers, incredible speakers. And the topic is also uh, very hot, especially for me as a penis surgeon. It is uh, always interesting to know uh, the other side. So, um, Today we will have our lecture on female orgasm and we have uh, two outstanding moderators. We have uh, Selchen, uh, can you go back? Um, Selchen Bahadir from uh, Turkey and uh, she wrote a book in Turkish language about uh, female pleasure, about um, vagina and clitoris. And um, I think, uh, this is incredible work, especially for the uh, person who is uh, uh, from the uh, Eastern country. Um, another person is uh, Lisa. Lisa is my uh, former uh, fellow and uh, she was my PhD student and uh, she loves andrology and she loves uh, penile prosthetic surgery and, and also um, uh, sexual, female sexual function. So um, first, of all, um, <clears throat> of course, um, it is important to say that uh, such activities are not possible without uh, support of the companies. And uh, we are very thankful uh, and proud to have IPSA as a main sponsor of the webinar series of, of the ASSM. 
we would have another um, activities with IPSA. And uh, as you know, uh, our educational uh, projects are going on. Um, and uh, with the support of IPSA and our other main sponsor, sponsors, uh, we um, already had our um, preparation course and the next, uh, we planned the next ESSM School of Sexual Medicine. And the next advanced course on sexual medicine will be um, as usual in Budapest between 24th of November and 3rd of December, 2023. So you can uh, register yourself. Um, yeah, as you know, we started a new EFIS project, uh, which is uh, ultrasound school on uh, females as a gynecological project. And this is a brand new project, um, fully dedicated to female ultrasound. Also a two day course in Budapest, 23rd and 24th of November, as well as uh, training in the centers of excellence. Excellence. We have a new uh, chair um, of the Educational um, ASSM Academy on Genital Surgery, uh, Professor Kuhn von Rentenham from Belgium. Um, and we are going on with our uh, um, educational uh, program on male genital surgery, uh, especially on prosthetic urology. We have level one, level two, and level three. Uh, or steps of education. So the news will be announced soon. Um, we have, um, of course, uh, our manual, our Bible um, of sexual medicine, as well as uh, a book of clinical sexology. So we are working on updates and we will have uh, our edition, hopefully in the next future, 2024. Uh, <clears throat> As I already mentioned, uh, we already had our preparation course to obtain MGCSM and EFS certification in the field of sexual medicine. And uh, now we are directly moving on to the uh, examination and I wish you great success for all participants. So um, I want to encourage you to join the next ESSM in um, Bari in Italy the uh, motherland of our past president, uh, Professor Carla Bitocchi. So webinar today, I want uh, to introduce uh, Professor Anna Maria Giraldi. She is a past president of the International Society for Sexual Medicine. Uh, professor Giraldi is a, a professor of clinical sexology and uh, um, psychiatry. Um, she's a deputy ed editor of the journal Sexual Medicine. Um, and uh, Professor Giraldi is a senior uh, consultant in psychiatry in the sexologic clinic at Psychiatric Center Copenhagen. Our next speaker is Professor, uh, please next slide, Jane Faust. Um, uh, Professor Faust um, is a director of research um, center of sexual health and intervention of the Czech National Institute of Mental Health, um, chair of the ESSM EFS European Psychosexology Accreditation Committee. So enjoying uh, the webinar today, we, um, as I said, collected um, outstanding speakers for you and uh, beautiful uh, moderators enjoy uh, the webinar. Okay. Well, I'm gonna share my screen. However, I can't share while other people are sharing. <laughs> we need to stop. That's that's correct. And now, okay, good. You can share your screen, Jim. Please, I'd like to remind all the, uh, the people connected to write the possible question in the Q and A <clears throat> section. Please, Jim. Okay, so I'm gonna start with kind of an overview of the neurophysiology of female orgasms. And here are my disclosures. Nothing I'm gonna be talking about today has anything to do with any of this other than my grants. What is an orgasm? Well, it comes from the Greek orgasmus, meaning excitement or swelling. There are many definitions of what an orgasm is. And over time, they've gotten 
more and more complex. But if we go back to Albert Moles, the voluptuous apne, the, the high point of the sexual response cycle, that's coincident with rhythmic contractions of perineal muscles. So there's sensory input and there's muscular motor output. And I want to remind everyone that orgasms are a total whole body experience. So as I mentioned, you have sensory input from genital and extragenital erogenous and erotic sources, which is basically everything. And you have motor output that goes to the pelvic floor, but not just the pelvic floor, it goes to your face, to your trunk, to your limbs, to visceral muscles, to produce an entire experience of the motor aspect of orgasm, which can never really be distinguished from the sensory input. When we think of the EPOR model of Masters and Johnson, orgasm occupies, as Mo suggested, that high point. The high point at orgasm comes from of summed sensory input, which in part is sympathetic and in part is parasympathetic. When orgasm occurs, it activates inhibition, total brain inhibition coming from the prefrontal cortex on down it gives rise to the activation of beta endorphin, which makes your orgasms feel wonderful, and serotonin, which gives you a sense of satiety. But the resolution that Masters and Johnson talked about is really refractoriness, and refractoriness is inhibition. And inhibition feeds back lock all of the excitatory systems that come online with sexual arousal and desire and the interaction and activation of sex play uh, through the plateau. Now, both excitation and inhibition are active processes in the brain and body, and they're always on at the same time, such that you'll notice in the brain, you've got both red areas, which are excitatory, and blue areas that are inhibitory, and they're online at the same time. Why is that? As Barry Kamasark reminds us, inhibition during sexual stimulation keeps it from becoming aversive, so that it doesn't shoot up too quickly, and become something in the genitals that you would regard as too much stimulation. Well, okay, so where does orgasm come from in women? And there's a long history of controversy, and the controversy is really between the clitoris and the vagina. Hippocrates argued in favor of the clitoris, that it was critical for orgasm and sexual pleasure. Galen said, no, 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 it's the vagina. The vagina is an inverted penis. It's the seat of all sexual pleasure in women. Fallopio, for, who, for whom we have the fallopian tubes, said the clitoris is actually a small penis and clearly stimulates the generative response in all women. And then we get to Sigmund Freud, who argued that yes, clitoral stimulation is good, kids love it, but that when you become an adolescent, when puberty kicks in, you must move that clitoral stimulation into the vagina for it to ripen, ripen, for it to become fully reproductive. So clitoral pleasure had to transfer to the vagina during puberty. Well, where does it really come from in women? Osmo Kantula did a study in uh, Finnish women across the lifespan. And one of the interesting things is you've got alone here in blue. You've got both clitoris and, and vaginal stimulation in orange. And then you've got vaginal stimulation alone in gray and then no orgasm at all. And one of the things that I find really striking in these data are that across the lifespan, there's a slight decrease in exclusive clitoral gland stimulation to orgasm. And if anything, a slight increase in this blended kind of stimulation, stimulation of both the glands of the clitoris and something inside. What's inside? It's also the case that in this study, the stimulation needed or preferred to reach orgasm, the highest proportion of women said penile vaginal intercourse or intercourse with a toy, but something where you're dealing with both clitoral stimulation or glands clitoral stimulation and vaginal stimulation and everything else, orogenital stimulation, for example, by your own hand was less preferred than penile vaginal stimulation. So why is that? Because the clitoris is a homologous structure to the penis. You can see the gland, the shaft, the bulbs, the crus. This clitoris is an erect clitoris because you notice the bulbs are engorged. And when the bulbs are engorged, 
because the clitoris is a largely internal structure, the bulbs are now placing pressure around the vagina, which you can detect. You detect that pressure with photoplethysmography, but you can also detect it by it being now more sensitive to tactile stimulation. And what's sensitive? The nerves that innervate the region. They're the same nerves, different curves, but the same nerves as we would find in the male, the pudental, the pelvic, the hypogastric, and the plexus, or the vagus. The pudental is activating a whole plexus of clitoral glands, sheath, labia, and anus. Pelvic nerve is activating the so-called G-spot, which would be the kind of rear end of the clitoris, right? And the vaginal wall and the cervix. The hypogastric is also activating that, that rear end of the clitoris, plus the periurethral glands and what would be the female prostate, but also the clitoris itself, the vaginal wall and the cervix. And the vagus is activating the cervix and the uterus, and perhaps even the prostate in the male. So you have a multitude of nerve activation that are occurring by the sensory stimulation of what I'll call three triggering zones. The glands of the clitoris, the G-spot area, and the cervix. Barry Commissar gave a beautiful talk at the ISSM uh, SMSNA meeting where he talked about multiple sensory nerve stimulation and how it sums to give you a different sensation of orgasm. So for example, clitoris, perigenital skin, produce a very localized sensory input that produces a feeling, a localized feeling of orgasm. As you extend that into the vagina, you have women recalling a deep or heaving orgasm, which when you blend it together, you get the blended kind of orgasm that Osmocontula women across, the, across their lifespan are talking about. But now add to that the activation of the cervix and the uterus. And one of Barry's uh, women referred to that as a shower of stars. So things are getting more and more intense the more sensory nerve stimulation you actually have, such that the deepest and most intense are the nerves, are all four nerve stimulations that are occurring and producing motor output. So these general sensory triggering zones are innervated by multiple nerves and they're activated by the kind of penile or toy position in vaginal and clitoral stimulatory in intercourse. So notice the penis can fit into many different positions, but you've got three kind of main ones here, which depend on the position. Some of which, like number three, might give you direct gland clitoral stimulation, but not necessarily stimulate the cervix or any internal structure other than the vagina itself. Whereas number one might be very good at stimulating you know, the G-spot area and the cervix, especially if a woman's on top and can rock her body back and forth, rocking the penis against the cervix and against the G-spot, and perhaps even against the glands of the clitoris. Now, why do I say that? Because in this wonderful study done by Schultz et al., where they had two uh, uh, Soleil acrobats who were put into the MRI and were actually having sex in the MRI, notice that as da Vinci would have predicted, the penis itself curves to the shape of the vagina. But if you look at the three triggering spots here on the right-hand side, the glands is getting stimulated, the G-spot area is getting rubbed against, and the cervix, the anterior part of the cervix, is also potentially getting stimulated. So it, that stimulation is going to depend on your own experience with the kind of positions that allow for maximal pleasure. Manual self-stimulation and manual partner stimulation are good, but when you think about the average length of the vaginal canal from labia to cervix being anywhere between seven and a half to 15 and a quarter centimeters, it's all gonna depend on how long the fingers are, how aroused the vagina is and the clitoris is, and how well adept that hand is at knowing what kind of stimulation to produce. Toys might be good, but there's no guarantee that you can stimulate everything. 
There's no guarantee, especially of cervical stimulation, except at orgasm due to uterine contractions. Well, when you receive that stimulation, where does it go? It goes to the brain, and in particular to the paracentral lobule in primary sensory cortex. Men have one, and of course, the one by Penfield is always the one in all the textbooks, but women have one too with a rather large gendrosensory area. Barry Kamasarik shows us that when you stimulate the clitoris, meaning the external glands, the internal part of the vagina and the cervix, you activate overlapping regions of that main sensory cortex. They're overlapping. Why are they overlapping? Because the nerves are overlapping that are coming into the spinal cord and go getting into the brain. In fact, nipple stimulation and stimulation of the toes and the inner folds of the ear also overlap in this region. And that's really interesting, especially given that these are primary erogenous zones. Women who fantasize to orgasm without genital stimulation also show activation of this paracentral lobule. And you see that activation in women without hypoactive desire disorder, but those that have HSDD who don't charge the area, don't activate or prime the area, that area, we, at least with visual se sexual stimulation, doesn't get activated. So you've got bottom up, but you also have top down. Orgasms occur with the activation of these kind of hedonic hotspots in the brain, okay? And when they're activated, that summed sensory input produces a motor output. And of course, I, I believe as, as Dr. Giraldi will tell us, it can be inhibited by stress, by depression, by a lack of adequate arousal or stimulation and medications like SSRIs. So what about the output? The output is going to the pelvic floor and producing a characteristic kind of earthquake-like pelvic floor fibrillation uh, both of the perineal and pelvic floor muscles at orgasm. And this is true of men, it's true of women. You can detect it by vaginal pressure in women and also by anal pressure, with the anal pressure being offset by about 20 milliseconds. Bolin did a series of studies looking with vaginal photoplethysmography and anal, and anal uh, 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 muscle, muscle spasm detection, looked across many different that he noticed was, again, that the anal contractions mirror the vaginal contractions. They don't really mirror it. What they're doing is they're just elapsed in time such that when things are starting here, closer to the introitus of the vagina, they're spreading out through the pelvic floor and the perineal muscles to the anus. Bolin himself noticed that there were three different types of orgasm, kind of like Master and Johnson noticed there were three types of sexual response resulting in orgasm. One was short with very regular uh, uh, contractions. Another was long with again, regular contractions. And the other was a medium length in time, about 48 seconds, but with irregular contractions. The lioness vibrator allows women to do this at home. So instead of having to come into a lab, they can do this at home. It gives you biofeedback output. And we're doing a lot of work with Linus uh, to try to determine what these orgasms are, what they look like, and what they feel like in women. The output has names now. So the wave corresponding approximately to Master and Johnson's type two. You can see it up there. You have simply waves that start with an elevated pelvic floor tension and then result in orgasm. There's something called an avalanche where the orgasm itself, instead of being a wave above the mean pelvic floor, kind of waves itself downward like an avalanche might. And the other is kind of a volcano where you have sort of these pulses of vaginal floor tension or pelvic floor tension that then results in a huge increase in tension that then is resolved at orgasm, uh, given it the name the volcano because of what it looks like. Now, the brain regions that are controlling this are not only coming from that S1, but from other regions, medial orbital frontal cortex, that nucleus of the street terminalis, the amygdala, the preoptic area. And they're all impinging on the periaqueductal gray, the PAG, that has two main outputs. One is to the pelvic floor stimulating center, and the other is the pelvic organ stimulating center. So these things are co-occurring. And what's really co-occurring once this region is stimulated 
is muscle output that goes both to smooth muscle of the uterus and the bladder and to the pelvic floor itself so that you can get kind of a cervicouterine reflex happening and a bladder reflex that's happening. You can feel those butterflies in your stomach as orgasm occurs. There's a set of neurons called the lateral spinothalamic neurons, LST. They're found in L3 and L4 of the lumbar cord, and they are essentially the orgasm generating neurons. They are producing a fast activation, kind of the point of no return, a fast activation of sympathetic arousal that then kind of takes over the spinal cord. And when that happens in both men and women, you get two things. One, sexual climax at the level of the spinal cord, of the output that is going down to ONF's nucleus to produce the pelvic floor fibrillations. You also get activation that goes to the brain that produces the feeling of intense pleasure and CNS tension release that we know as sexual orgasm. So here's another way of looking at it, that feeling of release, those in the lumbar se segments in the middle here, you have this threshold activation. Well, what you've been having during the plateau is slow ramping, progressive increase in sympathetic outflow, but it doesn't reach the critical threshold until these LST neurons turn on. Then you get the fast ramping point of no return and you get the switch from parasympathetic vasocongestion in the genitals to vasodilation which moves the blood back from the genitals back into the core, and you get the feeling of orgasm in the brain, the feeling of pleasure that's associated with it. So if we think of what Masters and Johnson were looking at at orgasm, they were looking at the extra genital, kind of the peak of respiration, the peak of blood pressure, the peak of heart rate, right? The sex flush that began to turn on at orgasm, perspiration, et cetera. As far as the breasts and the nipples were concerned, the areole had already produced its maximal tumescence during the plateau. So now you've got detumescence occurring. And again, with myotonia, you've got the contractions in the neck, the face, the arms, and the legs. They can become spastic and they become generalized at orgasm. When you look at the genital and pelvic areas, there's actually no change at orgasm, but then detumescence that occur, again, because of the opening of blood vessels. The cervix dilates the os immediately after orgasm, lasting about 20 to 30 minutes, and with dipping motions, you get contractions of the uterus and the rectal sphincter as a result of those contractions of the pelvic floor. Hormonally, you have increased secretion of prolactin. That's a beautiful kind of unambiguous marker of orgasm, but that's because prolactin is held in, in, in chronic inhibition by dopamine. And at orgasm, if you notice at the bottom, neurochemically, all of the neurotransmitters are immediately shut off. And they're shut off by the action of both the endogenous opioids like beta endorphin that are coming online and serotonin. Serotonin producing that feeling of satiety. And of course, being incredibly important for refractoriness. So you also have activation of oxytocin and vasopressin, both acting peripherally and centrally, producing perhaps a feeling of absolute desire to cuddle afterwards, to be sleepy afterwards, etc. You also have the activation of histamine from mast cells. These are cells that are found in the, in the blood lining around the genitals and elsewhere. Now, that activation typically does nothing, but in people that are sensitive to histamine, it likely is the cause of what we call post-orgasmic illness syndrome, where you have uh, both feelings of, of inflammation, feelings of, fe of being sick, of activation of prostaglandins that might actually increase your, your temperature, et cetera. People who are very, very sensitive to histamine and sensitive to mast cell activation syndrome will show these kinds of effects at orgasm. So we're talking about now association, an association of these tactile rhythmic genital stimulations of external clitoris gland, the internal part of the clitoris, the cervix, tactile pressure sense and proprioception of a penis or toy in the vagina against the vaginal walls, spreading them, pelvic floor, perineal, uterine, abdominal, facial muscle spasms, 
and all the extra genital things that you're experiencing while you're having sex. Tactile stimulation of erogenous zones, nipples, ear folds, toes, proprioceptive sense of how your body posture is in particular positions, what feels better, what feels less good, odors, tastes, visual cues, auditory cues, fantasy and imagery. These combine together the pleasure of orgasm. So really, it's about the whole versus the sum of some of the parts. The whole is what you know that works. The sum of some of the parts may work just as well, or they may work less well, because you know what stimulates you the best. So my take home messages are that the sensory and motor aspects of sexual climax and orgasm are felt together and they're linked together by associative mechanisms in the brain. What's critical is a woman's own experience with sexual stimulation and sexual pleasure. It's not clitoral or vaginal, it's both, along with sufficient arousal, competent stimulation, and where you place it depends on whether, you know, genital input, sensory input, motor output, or both are perceived as the predominant orgasm cues. So there's always room to experience something new. And despite common anatomy and neurophysiology, because everything I've told you is common to every orgasm in both men and women, every woman is different. And it's because every woman's experience is different. Thank you. Hello, good evening. Thank you, Jim, for this outstanding presentation. Um, please feel free to ask questions in the Q&A field or in the chat. So there is already one. Um, what is the evidence about orgasmic births? Maybe it's better uh, to address the questions at the end. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. Let's go ahead uh, with uh, uh, Anna Maria and then address the questions. Ah, okay, and then we do after. Okay. Okay, thank you, Giovanni, and, and thank you, Jim, for a great talk, and thank you for the organizers to have me here talking about orgasmic dysfunction, and I'm going to address assessment and treatment. Those are my disclosures. I don't have any conflict of interest um, giving the talk I'm giving today. So what I would like to address in my talk is how do we define orgasm problems in women? talk a little bit about how often do women experience orgasmic problems and what are some of the factors we know that are negative and positive for women having an orgasm and in the end also how do we treat orgasmic problems but before i do that i really would like you we are more than 100 people here to respond to how do you treat orgasmic problems in women do you give hormonal treatment especially if it's postmenopausal women do you use physiotherapy? Do you use sensate focus? Do you direct it masturbation? Do you do a combination of these or do you do none of these? So please put in your response so we can see where you are in the treatment of orgasmic problems. Thank you everybody for voting. We will just allow a few more seconds. I see that a lot are voting. Thank you so much. So another few seconds and then I will share the results so that we can see where we stand. So it's a little bit like the European Song Contest, but I can see that most of you say that you use a combination of the above. And I think that is also my take home message that very often when you treat women with orgasmic problems, you need to have a combination of different treatment modalities, but it will also be based on how the woman is describing her problem. So, so first of all, now Jim told us very nicely, what is an orgasm? 
So I will just see how do we define anorgasmic dysfunction. And if we look at the ICD-11, you can see that they define anorgasmia as the absence or marked infrequency of the orgasm experience or markedly diminished intensity of orgasmic sensation. And it includes marked delay in orgasm. So it can both be that the woman is not able to have an orgasm, but it can also be that it takes very long time or maybe that the sensation has changed so it's not so intensive anymore. And we also have to remember that it's something that occurs despite adequate sexual stimulation. And maybe this is something we're gonna talk about in the discussion, because if the woman doesn't have desire or is not aroused, that's the main problem. And she doesn't have an orgasmic problem, because if you don't have desire and you're not aroused, it will be difficult to be uh, orgasmic. And also it has to be occurring episodically or persistently over at least several months, and the woman has to be distressed by the condition before it's a dysfunction. What is so nice about uh, the uh, ICD-11 is that they also add these specifiers, and you can talk about whether it's lifelong or acquired or generalized or situational, but it also talks about what is it associated with, and this really tells that there can be so many reasons for women having orgastic problems. It can be related to psychological or behavioral factors, including mental disorders, the use of psychoactive substances or medication, the lack of knowledge or experience, so you actually don't know how to get an orgasm, relationship factors, cultural factors, or other specified uh, factors. So this really tells that there's so many reasons why women can have orgasmic problems. I'm gonna come back to that. So when we look at the clinical presentation, these are the definitions, the women will come and complain of different things. They might never experience an orgasm. Maybe they're capable of having an orgasm when they masturbate, but not with their partner. Or maybe they can reach orgasm with their partner, but maybe not through intercourse, as Jim also elucidated. And maybe they orgasm physically, uh, but do not or only very weakly have the feeling of pleasure or release of tension. So there are many ways women can come to the clinic and describe orgasmic problems. So how often do women say they have problems with orgasm? There are not that many studies, but the studies shows that there's a huge variation in what women report. And there's also variation with, in different parts of the world. And this is just to tell you that there are studies that show from about 4% to 40% of women saying they have orgasmic problems with the highest prevalence in the Southeast Asia and the lowest prevalence in Northern Europe. This is from a Danish study where they asked more than 30,000 women whether they had distressing problems with reaching orgasm in the last year. And as you can see, the younger women had more problems that were distressful for them that the older women had. You can see you have the younger women from 15 to 24 years at your left and the older women more than 75 years on your right. But also, if we look at another study, this is an American study on more than 30,000 women too, you can see that if you have low orgasm capacity, that the gray bars, it's something that increases with age, but the women are not so distressed about it. So this tells us that women that get older might have more problems in having an orgasm. We did a study some years ago where we wanted to investigate in, in a population of US women, uh, describe their sexual function with a special focus on their orgasmic uh, function and satisfaction and what could trigger an orgasm in these women. And what we showed was that if we asked the women over the past four weeks, when you have sexual stimulation or intercourse, how often did you reach orgasm? You can see that almost 30% of the women said that they always reach orgasm, about 25% most of the time and 17% sometimes. If we ask them how often they reach orgasm during vaginal intercourse, you can see it was a little bit less that said that had orgasm most of the time or sometimes. And actually some of the women said they were not sure or they never had an orgasm when they had intercourse. But also some of the women said they never had one when they had sexual stimulation or intercourse on, on the lift. So this tells us that a lot of women will have an orgasm, but also there are some women that rarely have it or never have it or only sometimes have it. So when we look at some of the factors that were associated with uh, or positively correlated to having an orgasm frequent was that they liked sex and they had foreplay. And some of the factors that were negatively correlated were poor emotional relationship with the partner, the partner's willingness to have sex, and if the partner had an erectile dysfunction or premature ejaculation. 
So we also looked at how satisfied they were with their ability to have an orgasm. And about 60% said they were satisfied and about 24% said they were dissatisfied. And we also asked how long it took for them to have an orgasm. And you can see it was a little bit faster than they had the external stimulation instead of having the vaginal intercourse, which might be related to what Jim described for us, how is stimulation when you have an intercourse compared to when you also have external stimulation. So when we looked at this, they described some promoting factors and other studies have looked at what are good factors for women having an orgasm or being able to have an orgasm. So if you have manual genital caressing during sex, if you are used to use a vibrator, if you think sex is something that is important, if you have early age at first orgasm intercourse, not meaning you're a child, but maybe when you're a teenager, when you're allowed to have sex before you get married, if you have oral sex, if you have foreplay, if you like sex, if you have good sexual communication with your partner, if you and your partner have good sexual techniques, and if the women are interactive or and active in the intercourse, and if you have orgasm by P9 motion, because then you will have most stimulation when you have a heterosexual intercourse. We also know, as Jim said, some of the negative uh, um, factors that might inhibit orgasm. And there are so many of them. So I'm just gonna briefly mention them that we know a lot of medication will have a negative impact, some medical condition, especially the neurological diseases, incontinence, gynecological um, conditions, vulvar dystrophia, age changes and genital mutilation. We know that psychological factors that stress, nervousness, depression, anxiety, OCD, lack of concentration, the fear of losing control, being very inhibited, or having a uh, not so much attention to sexual stimuli, and also having what we call spectatoring, where the woman will see everything from outside and judge it and not feel what is actually happening in her body, but being like a spectator, looking at herself from the outside. We know that physical abuse, relationship satisfaction, sexual abuse, if the partner has sexual problems, lack of communication and lack of stimulation are very important factors. And then we also know that culture has an influence because cultures with very restricted attitudes towards sexuality and lack of sexual education for both men and women might have a very negative impact on women. How do they learn to have an orgasm? How are they allowed to investigate? How do I get an orgasm? So it has a negative impact. This is a very interesting study that I just wanted to mention where they looked at the impact of sexual orientation and the ability to have an orgasm. And as you can see on the right, heterosexual women, lesbian women, and bisexual women were reporting if they never rarely, half of the time, usually, or always had an orgasm when they had sexual stimulation. And you can see that lesbian women more often had, sex, had orgasm they had higher level of orgasm than bisexual women that again had more orgasm than heterosexual women. And this has raised the whole discussion and concept of the orgasm gap that women and men also have different levels of or having an orgasm where studies say that almost 100% of men have an orgasm when they have intercourse, whilst it might only be about 60 to 7% of women. So there's a gap between what they experience and maybe this is explaining why uh, heterosexual, uh, homosexual women have more orgasms because they know how to stimulate each other. They have different sexual scripts. So how can we use this in our clinical work? I think that what Jim also told us is that an orgasm is not just an orgasm and there are many ways to reach an orgasm and orgasms may change. They may change over time. They may change with the partner you have. They may change with the stimulation you have. And we know they are both promoting and inhibiting factors for having an orgasm. And this is what we want to explore when we treat the women for their orgasmic problems. So I think that when we talk with women about their orgasmic problems, the assessment of the problem, the way we ask the woman, the way we discuss with the woman, how is your problem presenting itself is so important. We need to do a very thorough assessment. We need to ask the women if the orgasms are absent, are they delayed or are they reduced in intensity? Is she distressed about the problem or is it the partner that's distressed? Is the problem acquired or lifelong? Is it always there or is it generalized? Is it situational? Are there other sexual problems? Maybe it's not an orgasmic problem, but she thinks it's an orgasmic problem. The partner thinks it's an orgasmic problem. And is there adequate and acceptable 
stimulation with the partner and with masturbation? What is our experience with the partner? What is our experience with masturbation? Is there a medical condition that can explain the orgasmic difficulties? Is there a medication or substance abuse that might be the reason for the difficulties? What are the psychological aspects? Is she has she anxiety? Is she depressed? Are there any other concerns? And what is the context? Is there trust and safety uh, in the relationship or when she has sex? Is there a fear in her of letting go of control? And what does she fear might happen that could be negative if she has a, uh, if she's afraid of letting go of control? And what is the sexual script? I put that in red because I think it's so important that so many people, both men and women, have an idea about how is sex going to be. It's always going to end with an orgasm. There has to be vaginal stimulation. So what is the sexual script they have? What is the sexual script the woman has? So that leads us to the treatment of sexual, uh, uh, orgasmic sexual problems. And I think the treatment, it needs to be based on the assessment. We don't have any specific approved medication for treatment of orgasmic disorders. We also lack larger control studies where we compare one treatment with another treatment, but we have some research. We have a lot of clinical practice that you can base your treatment on, and it needs to be individualized. As, as uh, Jim said, every woman has a different orgasm. Every woman has a different experience, and we also need to individualize the treatment. And it might include many of our traditional psychosexual techniques and methods to treat and modalities. And very often, as I said in the beginning, we use many different methods. So I think the first step is the basic step. We need to inform and educate. So we need to talk to the women about what is an orgasm? How do you get it? How don't you get it? If you try to get it all the time, you're so focused on this is the end point. Maybe you can run after it all the time, but it will always be in front of you. You'll never get it. How does the body work? How does it work with the, the experience, with pleasure, with everything that has to do with sexual pleasure? We might change medication if she's on a medication that can inhibit orgasm. We might give hormonal optimization if it's a postmenopausal woman. We might give PVD and five inhibitors if it's a woman on SSRI that had orgasmic problems after that. And we also can try to regulate underlying conditions. But I think this is so important that we inform, educate, and try to change what is changeable. The next steps, I put it in, in individual and couple related, because I think if a woman is not able to reach orgasm alone, I would always start her on treatment alone and involve the partner later. I think the woman needs to learn by herself how does she get an orgasm. We cannot expect that the partner can find out if she doesn't know. And you can use many methods. You can use people therapy, podcast, search for erotic liter literature, pornography, and we also add self-investigation. She needs to look at her genitals. How do they look? You might add physiotherapy, kegels exercise, so she can learn about her pelvic floor, how to relax it, how to contract it. You might do what we call autosensate focus, where she stimulates herself. She needs to explore what is pleasurable for her, what is not pleasurable. How does she like to be touched? Where does she like to be touched? What are erogenous zones for her? She can use a vibrator. She can do masturbation exercises in order to learn how to get an orgasm and be comfortable with what is pleasurable for her. You can also add mindfulness or other therapies with a focus on anxiety and psychological factors. Um, and you can do it both with a focus on what's happening in her, but also what is happening in the relationship. And also talk to her about what are her experiences, how is she spectatoring, and what are her sexual scripts, as I mentioned before. So this is like the very, very traditional sex therapy uh, way of, of treating sexual problems that we try to integrate both behavioral and more psychological aspects of the treatment. If she's in a couple and she's able to have an orgasm when she masturbates, but not with the partner, this tells us that maybe you need to do something differently when they are together as a couple. And then I would focus on the couple. And I would focus on how do they communicate about sex? Because we know that if you can communicate your needs and what you want, it's good for your orgasmic capacity. We need to reduce anxiety. What are the consequences if she doesn't have an orgasm? What happens in the dynamics in the couple? What are the sexual scripts? Again, spectatoring, expectations. What do they expect from sex? What does it have to prove about him or uh, her, the other the partner, uh, to have an orgasm? What is the goal for sex and intimacy? And what is good sex? Is good sex always having an orgasm? Are they too focused on this orgasm? 
What is the partner's reaction? Is the partner getting angry? Is the partner starting to cry? What is happening when she cannot have an orgasm? Or does the partner have sexual problems? And what is going on in the dynamics of the couple? And then you can introduce, again, the more sex therapeutic approaches with sensei focus, a focus on pleasure, adequate clitoral stimulation during partner sex. And this might be what we call a coital alignment, which is a, a way of having intercourse where you have more stimulation of the whole vulva area and not only on in the vagina. Or you might find out what position does she like, what positions are good. Maybe you need to have stimulation other places of the body and not only during intercourse. Maybe you need to use vibrators. So you try to integrate this in the treatment. So in conclusion, my take home messages are that many women will experience orgasmic problems. And I think that it's so important that you have a very, very thorough assessment when you talk to women about orgasmic problems and education and information is really valuable. So you need to talk to the women about what is promoting and what is inhibiting their orgasmic uh, experiences. And very often individual treatment is beneficial for the women to learn about what is pleasurable for her? How does she get an orgasm? And if the partner, if it's only a problem with the partner, you should include the partner with traditional uh, focus, uh, uh, sex therapy focus, on communication, sensate focus, looking at the sexual scripts. And very, very often you need to combine the different uh, treatment modalities we have. So I just want to thank you for being here and hope we will have discussions and the many questions I can see that's here. Thank you so much. Yes, thank you for this amazing presentation, Professor Anna Maria and uh, Professor Jean Pauls. We have some questions uh, from our uh, from our participants. I, I want to ask you first of uh, one is to Jean. Yes, what's the evidence about orgasmic birth, Jean? Earth. Well, I mean. Again, it's it's one of those things that's very difficult to study because how can you predict that it's gonna happen a priori? So women will say post hoc that the actual birth felt like they were having an orgasm. And you can imagine what's happening in the pelvic floor. I mean, you're moving this entity through the vaginal canal, which is really kind of, you know, activating the pelvic floor completely. Right. In fact, you need to be able to have control over the pelvic floor to produce that. So think of orgasm not only as kind of sensory input and motor output, but that motor output actually has something called motor memory to it, such that, you know, people can be hypnotized to have orgasms. They can have it through tantric meditation. They can learn how to stimulate their own pelvic floor. And I would imagine that a woman who is sensitive to that and who now generalizes the experience of childbirth can have an orgasm. Is it bad? No, it's normal. It's absolutely natural and normal to have this. Okay. Uh, and I think this question is for you. Why is orgasm is more common experience in women than in men? So I it was for me, Selton, because I couldn't hear you. There's, there was some noise on, on the could you please repeat it? Okay. Why multiple orgasm is more common experience in women than in men? What is why is what more common in women? So, uh, the question think... is Anna Maria. The question is uh, I think uh, is for both of you. Okay. Uh, the difference in the frequencies of reaching orgasm between uh, men and women. Yeah. Uh, I, I would like to start with this. I think that basically it's because and Jim, you might. Uh, Correct me because you're, you're talking about the physiology. I think that when men have intercourse, they have, most people have intercourse when they have sex. So when men have intercourse, I think they get both maybe the perfect stimulation to have an orgasm. Whilst as Jim showed that maybe the women won't have the, the perfect uh, the stimulation. So I think that's one of the reasons, I think it's physiology because maybe they don't have enough stimulation to have an orgasm. I think that's like the basic physiological change difference. There might also be some differences in, in 
I, I think one of the other differences is that when the man has his ejaculation, for most couples, everything stops. And, and maybe the woman, she's just didn't have enough arousal. So, so I think that that's also the reason that it stops when he has his orgasm. So that's why he will have it most of the time and then everything stops. I think that's the most common reasons and, uh, for, for, for the difference. And I think it's so interesting how we look at the difference uh, because I think that men and women are equally able to have orgasm, but it also tells us maybe women need more stimulation. They need stimulation after the partner ejaculated. They might need uh, another type of stimulation when they have uh, the, the sexual uh, intercourse or, or whatever sexual activity they have. Yeah, I would only add to that exploration. I mean, a penis is very easy to stimulate. A whole clitoris is not. It depends on, you know, again, your manual dexterity, what you know about your body. And uh, we don't treat women the same way that we treat men. I mean, can women explore? Yes, they can. Do they? That's yeah. another question. So there's also a cultural aspect. Exactly. I think that, and I mean, maybe men are better in, in, in not taking, but, but having what they, they, they really would like to have. It's more acceptable. So I think that we really need to think biopsychosocial here because there are many reasons. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, so there will be another question. If a young female uh, circumcised, most common of religious or traditional um, reasons are having problems with orgasms during sex, how are there medications or maneuvers to help them? Do you want to say something, Jim? Or, or... Well, I mean, circumcised or excised, right? Because cl clitoral circumcision, just like male circumcision, if it's really truly a circumcision, is not kind of, it's not getting rid of the nerves. But if it's the clitoral excision, that happens in some cultures where, you know, essentially you're keeping women down, literally, not just figuratively, you are, I mean, you're getting rid of nerve. The dorsal clitoral nerve is quite often cut. Now, the internal part of the clitoris is still there and women can learn to, you know, essentially give themselves pleasure by activating what remains of that dorsal clitoral nerve going into the pudental. But it's it's hard to say. Are there medications that can give you a new nerve? No, not yet. But are there ways that you have preserved clitoral and cervical activation? Absolutely. And I think that there's so many aspects of, of genital mutilation. And I think there's also the psychological aspects. Are you, I mean, that, to me, it's abuse. I mean, it, it's sexual abuse. It's, it's abuse that you, you treat women. Uh, it might be very, very violent for her to, to have gone through this uh, circumcision or we don't know so that might, it might be a trauma and also so my as a I would also focus on she needs to find out what is pleasurable for her because a lot of women can have pleasure they just need to find out what stimulation is pleasurable for them and is sex something that's pleasurable or do you have a lot of traumatic experiences that says it's not uh, it's not pleasurable so I think that's a very important thing too if we should think of a drug, if you think there's still some clitoral or cavernosal uh, tissue left, I mean, you could think of a PD5 inhibitor, but I think that has never been really shown or, or tried uh, or investigated. And I think you should go in many other directions and try to find out what is pleasurable for these women, because there might be so many other places, as Jim is saying, that might uh, create uh, sexual pleasure and orgasm. Yeah. So uh, do you think it is also possible to train yourself to have different kinds of orgasms? Short answer is yes. I, I think you, you can. And I think that what we know is that people that have, for example, spinal cord injury and, and lose their sensitivity in, in, in genitals, they can train themselves to have stimulation from other areas like the ears or the nipples or other parts of the body. So I think, I think yes, and when you know that people maybe I showed you the picture that younger women have more problems in at least in one study. Maybe it's because they haven't tried so much. Maybe you throughout life you'll try. You start with intercourse, then you do oral sex. Maybe you do anal sex. Maybe you do other things that you find out there's so many different ways that you can get the stimulation. Yeah, it's all a matter of experience. 
and, and feeling comfortable and, yeah. and being relaxed and not feeling you have to perform specific things and also have a positive view on your own sexuality and your partner and your body. May I ask a question? question? Yeah. yeah, please, Daniel. Um, as a, a penile prosthetic surgeon, I'm, I'm interested or we are all, always looking for the ideal form of the penis or ideal form of the penile prosthesis. And as I understand you, Jim, the, the curved form is the best one in order to get to the G-spot. My question is, does G-spot exist? There are so many uh, theories on it, also anatomical studies. I don't think it's a G-spot that exists in the vaginal wall. I think it's an area around the vaginal wall that the back end of the clitoris exists, where the bulbs, right, when they're engorged, are actually, are, are actually touching that region, in addition to the fact that you have a female prostate, right, the skein's glands, which are producing prostatic fluid. If you actually were to squeeze them, they are the progenitor of the prostate. So you have sensory input that's coming from that back end that's coming in with the dorsal clitoral nerve. So if you were to touch that area, you're not just touching a G spot, you're touching kind of a complex that's the rear end of the clitoris, the bulbs, skein's gland, et cetera. So does it exist? Not necessarily the way the term the G-spot is used in the popular press, but it is a region of sensitivity. But do all women experience the same sensitivity? Can they experience the same sensitivity? So we can train people in you know, a, a, a kind of an RCT. We don't really know. I think the vagina itself is sufficient to give the curvature to the penis. I don't think we need a curved, you know, sort of almost Peroni's penis going into the vagina to produce G-spot stimulation. I don't think that's going to be anything preferred. So I think the vagina itself is capable of producing just the right curvature at the right time. And I think that's what people explore when they explore different positions, because they find out that in different positions, the, the curve is maybe a little bit more stimulating than other positions. And that's why you need to try to find out that how do I like it best? How do we like it best? Yeah. Thank you. Well, Lisa, Selena, I think we have a space for two other, a couple of questions. So I think yes. go, you can go ahead. There was another question and they were asking um, why uh, women feel lack of sex when they are in their early menopause and experience symptoms of that. Sorry, say that again, why women? Why women have lack of sex or which is less, why they have less sex uh, when they experience symptoms of early menopause? I, I think it's very, I mean, uh, there may, might be many explanations, but one of the, the very easy explanations are changes in hormones. So maybe this has more to do with desire. It has to do with uh, maybe more pain, lack of arousal because of changes in estrogens. And maybe a lot of women will also experience that the orgasmic experience is different when they have entered menopause and have gone through menopause. It's uh, Jim describes as vol volcano. I had a patient that said it was like a huge wave and now it's just a little blurb. So something happens with the changes, but I think that the frequency and that's ma mainly because of uh, lack of, of estrogens and, and hormonal changes and also maybe pain if they have lack of estrogens. But there are also psychological changes. Many studies show that that's a whole webinar that there are so many, the transition when you, when you get older is also a psychological thing. Yeah, I mean, how sexy do you feel, yeah. right? I mean, it's not, we don't necessarily sexualize older individuals. And maybe that's something that needs to be done throughout the lifespan, that you are as sexy as you feel. Okay, thank you. And maybe the partner has problems. Yeah. So uh, there is another question asked for uh, Professor Giraldi. Um, how do you usually treat your clients? How have... Uh, who have trouble reaching an orgasm because of a tendency to be spectatory, possible due to perfectionism. Yeah, I think, <laughs> yeah, I think that one of the things I like that we have introduced into to, to sex therapy is mindfulness. I, I think mindfulness is, is a very good 
way of trying to find out how do you really see what's happening inside your body and not judging in and see it from the outside. And also we do a lot of what we call also sensate focus where we ask the women to, to try to touch their whole body, trying to experience what is their body. And, and I, I think it's, uh, and then you, you try to, to you try to practice it and, and try to, when you recognize that you have all these thoughts about how do I look like, I want to be perfect, that you, you really try to explore your body, you try to be mindful, you try to, to feel your whole body. And, and it might take some time. Sometimes I, I feel that you need to have these women in therapy for quite a long time. And also to try to explore things, look at the erotic material. It's a very nice podcast. Oh my God, I think it's called. Um, where you can, you know, hear about other women's um, um, experiences. Uh, so, Jim and Maria, I have the last questions for you. Then we are going to close with a couple of slides. So, we are launching the uh, EFUS, so the SSM uh, Female Ultrasound School. Uh, um, as Jim also um, emphasized, that the the area there is no deep spot, but probably the area around. Uh, the wall of vagina and also Emanuele Iannini uh, produced very good the results on ultrasound. So what is the role of ultrasound, of female ultrasound in this uh, very, very difficult to treat uh, um, uh, female sexual dysfunction? So you're asking a psychiatrist and a psychologist, I think that's... <laughs> what do you think? I think that there's a space. At least we need to better study uh, the issue. I would think the more techniques that we can bring to bear on this, the better, because the more likely it is, just as, as Odile Boisson found with ultrasound and looking at the entire clitoral complex, before nobody knew. I mean, it was all just the, you know, the glands. But there was very little in any kind of gynecological or even endocrinological text about the clitoris. But she used ultrasound and Doppler and discovered the entire complex. So I think we're at the tip of the iceberg, if you will, in terms of understanding female, I, I mean, not just genital anatomy, but understanding how the nerves really work and how they produce pleasure in the brain. So oh. I, I think that my, my uh, two senses are that that I think that we we're not going to be able to diagnose using ultrasound I think that's I don't think because orgasm is a very subjective feeling as, as Jim told us uh, so I think that but it might add to our knowledge it might also add to if you have conditions like atherosclerosis we might learn more about how does that have an impact neuropathy a lot of different conditions that might have impact but I think we should always be careful to say that now we give you an ultrasound, you can see everything is okay, so you don't have a problem because the woman has a problem because it's a subjective feeling. But I think it can really add on to all the things that we don't know about orgasm and how the genesis are working in women. So thank you, Ana Maria. I learned a lot uh, this uh, tonight. So just to close with few information on, uh, uh, first of all, I think uh, again, I'd like to thank IPSA for supporting uh, uh, all our activities. I'd like to thank uh, also Dania, the moderators that we have, so Lisa and Selene, uh, for chairing this fantastic section. I'd like to thank uh, these two fantastic uh, speakers, so Anna Maria and Jim. And I'd like to remind you that we are going to continue our uh, educational activity. So the next event will be on 12th of May, with live uh, streamed uh, from uh, uh, Slovakia Republic. And uh, for sure, uh, this is the issue. So lots how to manage couple sexual dysfunction along with Carlo uh, Reisman, Kobe Reisman, me and uh, Professor Skoll from Slovakia. So please uh, um, look at our social uh, message our website, and uh, I hope to see you um, numerous as tonight in our next educational activity. Thank you again for uh, being with us tonight. Have a great night, and thank you again, Jim, Anna Maria, Lisa, Selena, and Absolute Daniel. Thank you. Have a good night. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you.
Bye-bye.